Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Brenda Haug and I'm the facilitator for today's session. We have two very special guests with us today, Soon Hartan, who is a librarian at the Itasca Community Library in Illinois, where she has worked to create a vision center. And we're lucky to also be joined today by Tom Persky, who is the Senior Vice President, Rehabilitation Services for the Chicago Lighthouse. Tom has been a great resource for Sunhar, and I think he will be for all of us today, too. So welcome to them, and thank you all for being with us today. Before we begin, let me quickly tell you about the technology we're using, which is called ReadyTalk. So you should be hearing my voice right now, and that audio can play through your speakers or your headphones. And if that's not working, if it's choppy, that might be a bandwidth issue. And so there's a phone number you can use, too, and we'll put that phone number in the chat. And I'm going to just put a message up here, because if you're hearing me say this, then you're obviously not having the audio issues. So hopefully people will let, let us know in chat if they're having any audio issues. So again, if, if it's not working through your speakers or headphones, we'll share a phone number now and then throughout the session, and you can use that as an alternative. We have chat available, and we encourage you to use that throughout the session. Use it to ask questions that you have for the presenters. If you're having tech trouble, we have Becky and Sarah both there who can help. If you have resources that you want to tell us about or share with others, feel free to use the chat, chat throughout the session to do that. One of the questions people always have is, will this be recorded? And the answer is yes, it is being recorded right now. Later today we'll send, up a, send a follow up message and that message will contain a link to the recording, it will contain the PowerPoint slides, and then any websites that are mentioned or discussed during the session. I know both Sunhar and Tom are going to talk about a lot of resources and we have websites, links to those things, so we'll have those compiled for you so you can easily check them out after the session. One thing I will mention about the PowerPoint is that it was also attached to the reminder message that went out about this session an hour ago. So if you for some reason are having trouble seeing the slides this way, you have the PowerPoint slides um, at, that were part of that message that went out an hour ago. And again, we'll send all of this out later today, recording, PowerPoint, and links. Today's session is brought to you by several groups. I work with TechSoup for Libraries, which is part of TechSoup. TechSoup is an organization that helps nonprofits and libraries use technology to serve their communities. And TechSoup is one of the organizations that is part of a coalition called the EDGE Initiative. And that's what today's session is about. So it's funded by the Gates Foundation and it's being led by the Urban Libraries Council. The EDGE Coalition has been developing benchmarks for libraries. These are best practices to help public libraries assess where they're at with public technology services, and then also to help make plans for improving. There are 11 benchmarks in three categories that are part of, part of EDGE. And you can look at the categories there and see that it's not just things like the number of computers a library has or the amount of bandwidth. Those sorts of things are in there, but this is much broader. And these benchmarks are the basis of the EDGE assessment tool. And in January, all libraries will be able to use this assessment tool. And so the website and our follow-up message will have more information about that too. But today's session is based on one of the benchmarks, benchmark 11, which is Libraries Ensure Participation in Digital Technology for People with Disabilities. So today's session and the Vision Center and services and resources that we're going to talk about represent success with that benchmark. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Soon Har and Tom. Welcome to both of them and Soon Har. Thank you, Brenda. Hello, everyone. Um, I think that I would like to insert a disclaimer in here about the success. I think that is um, the process of um, trying to provide such a service is ongoing, so I think I will um, hold off on determining how much of a success this is. But um, we definitely have the services up and running, so that is what I would like to tell you about today. Uh, the Itasca Community Library 
is uh, situated in Itasca, Illinois, which is a western suburb about 20 miles west of Chicago. Um, we are a um, pretty small town, a village of just under 9,000, and uh, the library has a budget of about 1.3 million and a collection of um, a little over 100,000 um, items. So I have to say that um, what got us started um, was really our former director, Betsy Adamowski. Now, Betsy, the thing about Betsy is she is a huge advocate of libraries and library services, and she had this vision. She, she, has, she has perfect vision, literally, but um, she understands firsthand what it's like to live with a disability because uh, she's actually hearing impaired and has had two cochlear implants. So she's very empathetic to um, uh, people who live with um, a disability. The other thing um, that was happening was she's um, friends with Sharon Ruda from the um, Secretary of State's office. and. Um, so it was on her radar that uh, the Secretary of State, um, State's office um, provides services that can help people with disabilities, and I'll talk more about that later. And so um, it was a matter of timing. I had been at this library for about a year, and um, you know she decided that we were going to do this together. And so what um, we did was we started to do the research. Uh, by visiting a lot of libraries um, and talking to uh, people in, um, I don't want to call it the uh, industry, but people who work uh, providing services um, to um, people with vision impairments. So we found out what um, other libraries have, and uh, some libraries obviously do more than others. Um, we learned about the outreach programs. Uh, the assistive technology, um, and we also visited um, two places that I thought were very helpful. One was Spectrios, uh, which is a vision center in Wheaton, and uh, one was um, the talking book uh, center in Geneva called Voices of Vision. Um, and this is where the uh, Secretary uh, of State's office comes in. Uh, the Secretary of State's office uh, runs a program called the uh, Talking Books and Braille um, uh, Service. And what they do is um, they provide um, equipment and basically um, books used to be on cassette, but they are really phasing out the books on cassette. Um, they're now uh, moving them into digital downloads to people who can't see or hold um, printed material to read. And um, so by talking to Karen Odine at Voices of Vision and uh, Leah Gerlach at Spectrios, um, I started to learn more and more about what's available out there uh, to people with um, vision impairments. Um, and then through talking with Kristen Sanderson at the Elmhurst Public Library, I learned about the Chicago Lighthouse. Um, the Chicago Lighthouse is a, a, an organization in Chicago, and Tom can tell you more about the lighthouse um, that does so much for people with vision impairments. But because I, you know, I had never heard of them, I was not it, they were just not on my radar. And this is how it can be when you're just starting out. All these names and um, you know, descriptions, it, it, you, it's overwhelming because you know, one day you've never heard of the Chicago Lighthouse and what it does, and the next day you're learning so much about it. And so um, I contacted the Chicago Lighthouse um, to actually learn more about the type of equipment that my library um, might want to buy. Um, so that was that was part of the start. Um, should I keep going? Okay. Um, so basically, I had to become an expert about equipment and uh, services for the blind and visually impaired, 
and um, Soonhar, are you still there? Hi, Soonhar, are you still there? This is the operator. Hi, this is the operator. I'm just going to dial out to her, and I, I, see, I see that her line's con uh, connected still, but I'll just uh, dial back out to her. Just one moment, please. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Would you like me to talk sure, about the Sure, Tom, that would be great. Minutes? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Persky, and I'm employed at the Chicago Lighthouse. It's a private nonprofit organization um, that's been around 107 years serving uh, persons who are blind or visually impaired. Um, we have 26 actual different programs running under one roof. Uh, we also recently um, opened a center in the suburban area of, of Chicago. Uh, we have everything from a Chicago public school right inside the building. We are uh, actually have uh, programs for blind, uh, deaf blind. Uh, we actually have a factory where we do industries for the blind. We are the largest wall clock manufacturer in the United States. But we provide lots of low vision, what's called low vision rehabilitation, which involves uh, doctors that prescribe optical uh, magnifiers and telescopes and special devices to help people to maintain their independence. And then it goes uh, into a lot of technology of what could be recommended for someone after they've seen the doctor and they've used a magnifying glass, what, uh, what's available. So the two main categories for that have been really a, a part of what we do is helping somebody read print material and helping somebody access the computer. So if I were to say that those would be the two sort of main categories. <clears throat> I myself um, am visually impaired. I've been in this um, career for 30 years now. Um, I was diagnosed with a juvenile form of macular degeneration, which does happen. It's fairly rare. I was in, in the middle of my college years. So I had to, uh, my schooling was interrupted. I lost my central vision in both eyes, uh, gave up my artwork, uh, playing college basketball, and driving a car. And so with technology and learning back in the day, um, I tell people my first uh, CCTV video magnifier was made out of stone because that was the stone age. <laughs> I was able to return to college later in my 20s and on to graduate school using uh, technology. So it really did save my life, and that's really been my passion uh, all these years now, working with persons with low vision. Hi, Brenda. Can you hear me? Hi, Soonhar. Yes, glad you're back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know that's when, okay. though. Tom kind of introduced who he is and, and gave a little bit of his background so we can... Right. I could hear him. Um, oh, good. I guess okay. you couldn't hear me. Yeah. I don't know where I got cut off. Let's see. Well, you were talking about needing to become the expert, and then um, oh, I think okay, about there. Yeah. All right. So, yes. So, um, so basically, I felt that um, you know, all of a sudden, I had to know um, all these things about um, assistive technology. Even that itself is um, a phrase that I, I don't think that I had thought much about before. Um, it's also sometimes called adaptive technology. And, um, but I was working uh, with Tom and uh, one of his colleagues, Luke Scriven, at the Chicago Lighthouse. And uh, you know, basically, I said, if I were just starting out uh, from scratch and wanted to provide, um, wanted to have certain equipment or devices, you know, what would you recommend? Um, and so they, you know, threw a lot of names at me, and I had to, uh, you know, I, I basically learned about different things like, you know, what is a book reader, what is a CCTV, um, you know, um, things like that. 
and um, then considered whether these would be appropriate for uh, the library. And, um, and then basically, um, working very closely with Luke, I came up with a list of, um, it's almost like a wish list of uh, devices and equipment and how much each um, uh, cost and uh, gave this list to uh, Betsy and, um, and Betsy basically you know, put everything together and presented to the Lions. Um, Betsy had, um, and she's now with the Whitman Public Library, but Betsy had very good relationship with uh, local community groups and the Lions was one of them. And she knew she would have the support of the Lions when we uh, started out to do this. Uh, and so, you know, armed with all the research that I had done, um, she basically presented to the Lions, and um, at the very same meeting, they just wrote out a check uh, of over ten thousand dollars for her um, to buy um, all the equipment that I was recommending. I think that was one of uh, you know my most frightening moments to think that you know I was going to tell the Lions, "Here's how you could spend your money." Um, so it was thrilling when they uh, gave us the donation. And then basically we just had to uh, buy the equipment. And uh, really then the, the real work really began after that because then I would have to tell uh, the community that we have uh, these equipment and devices, uh, that we have these services, and, um, and hope that they, they come to the library and, right. uh, and use them. Well, you and mentioned lions, and Craig mentioned lions in the chat already too, and I know mm -hmm. Tom mentioned that when we were getting ready for this session. So I think that's, if people haven't thought of that or that made that connection before, that that's a, a focus area at the lions. And so if you have a lions group in your community, that might be a place to look. Sunhar, okay. one of the things you mentioned is that you were starting from scratch with this, and I'm guessing that we have people on today who are at all across the board, probably some have a lot of assistive technology already, some are just getting started, so we thought we would do a poll just to see where people are at. So if you can respond to this, does your library currently provide assistive technology, yes or no? Give you just a minute to weigh in on that. Okay. Oh, we have a few who don't have. Okay, we'll take just a few more seconds to weigh on, on that. Do you currently have any assistive technology? Do you provide it? Yeah. And three, two, one, we'll show the results. So it looks like a lot of you are providing it. And again, we encourage you to share things in the chat. If you have, as Sunhar talks about what they have, as Tom talks about some ideas, if, you've had the, if you have service resources that are really popular or that you've really liked, feel free to share those in the chat because we'll capture those too, but that's good to know. And then I think one of the other questions that Sunhar wanted to know is just if you're thinking about providing more or just getting started with assistive technology, what do you feel like is your greatest need? Is it to know more about the technology or is it to identify the needs in your community or just not sure about those? Do you not have administrative support? Sunhar talked about the director at her library and how important she was in getting this started, but that might not be the case in all, all libraries. Money, is it money or other? And if you want to share in chat other things that are, you feel are your biggest need as you get started with this or as you just think about it, providing more. Yeah, it looks like money is a pretty big obstacle. Okay, and then just needing to know more about the technology too. Good. Yeah, well, definitely. Again, yeah, that's what we'll talk about today, and we also have yes. resources that we'll share. So that yes, absolutely. Show those results. So I think we've got some people sharing in chat too some things. But okay, okay. So thanks everyone, and again, please keep sharing in the chat both your questions and your experiences, and we'll we'll keep capturing and sharing those too. All right. Um. 
So uh, I think that I want to uh, just, we can leave it at this slide, but I just want to address one of the responses that came up, which was um, needing to know, um, the, let me see if I can just, uh, no, sorry, I won't do that. Um, finding the need in the community. I think that's one thing that we did not do um, for background. I think that my director really kind of started with, we are going to do this. And, um, you know, and as Tom was saying earlier, we know that there is a, a big group of people out there with various various degrees of visual impairment. So you know the, the need is out there, uh, but in terms of your specific community and where those needs are, I think, that's, I think that's a constant challenge for libraries, knowing what our communities want, um, you know, so that we can give them what they want. But I think that, I think for us, that's, that's always a challenge. And in this particular case, I think that once I had uh, the services in place, I think that I felt that greatly. You know, when when I felt that people were not coming in to use, you know, my, my equipment and my services, I thought, you know, is it because I didn't really go out there to find out what exactly that people are wanting? Am I, you know, am I trying to give them something that they don't want or need? But, you know, at the end of the day, I really don't believe that. I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, just to keep at it in terms of getting the word out. So, um, so after um, we got the uh, donation from the Lions and uh, we bought the equipment, we, um, you know, decided that we were going to to launch this um, our services, and uh, we we call it "There's More Than One Way to Read a Book," and it's kind of inspired by the uh, the state's talking book program. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how I uh, decided. Uh, what to buy and what I bought because I can tell that for a lot of people that technology part um, is overwhelming. Um, so it really helped to work with uh, Luke um, at the Chicago Lighthouse, and I recommend that's what you do as well. Basically, if you have something like a Chicago Lighthouse in your community, and if you look into it, there will be many, many organizations in your community that work with the blind and disabled, and there will be experts who, you know, and, and really, the idea really is to work with those experts because, you know, we librarians, we are, uh, you know, we can't be an expert in one thing, but we, we can be good at, you know, tracking down information. So what I uh, decided to buy uh, were handheld magnifiers because I felt those would be practical. And I have two at the library, one that we allow people to use in the library, um, you know, whether it's to read uh, spines uh, on shelves. Uh, or um, you know to look at a magazine, and then we have a smaller one uh, that people can check out and bring home to use on a daily basis to try it out. And the idea of these handheld magnifiers um, was that they would they would use it and see how well they like it. And um, I mean, you know, hopefully they are actually using it as well for to meet their needs, but. Um, these are very um, expensive electronic magnifiers, and so if somebody is looking into buying it, then it's nice that they can try them out first to see um, how well they like them. So for example, um, one of our electronic magnifiers um, is uh, called a Luki Plus, and that costs about $500. Um, then the other thing that, um, that a lot of libraries have is a CCTV, and the one we have is called a Smart View Synergy, which I bought from the Chicago Lighthouse. And this is basically um, a, a, a magnifier um, with a screen. And uh, so the Smart View Synergy is, is, I like it very much because um, it's pretty basic, um, but I think it, you know, gives a very good image and. Uh, uh, it has a 
this one has a 19-inch screen, which I think is a good size. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is how I started out, like finding out what are some of the just basic things that we should have. So through my research, I also decided to buy a scanner reader. So basically a scanner reader is something that has a camera um, with what they call OCR and it optical character recognition, and it basically can read a page and read it back to you. So you can, you know, for somebody who ha has pretty much no vision, they can actually use this because it also has um, a hand, uh, it also has a hand gesture commands. So we we got an iPal, and the reason I got the iPal is because it's portable, and um, and it's important to have things that are portable because as part of the marketing, when you are um, you know going out to do a, a, a health fair or um, you know any kind of uh, place where you can you where you want to market your services, it's nice to have the equipment with you um, that you can show. So I like that. And um, then we also decided, I'm sorry, let me back up. So um, th through talking with Luke, what I learned was I should have um, devices that would um, work for people with low vision and um, and then that should be an option for people who are completely blind, such as the iPal. And a lot of libraries also that have assistive technology also use uh, something called JAWS, um, and that's for blind users, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And um, so what I've talked about so far, the handheld magnifiers and the CCTV and the iPal scanner reader, those equipment are for accessing written information. So written printed uh, materials, um, you can use the magnifier, the handheld magnifiers, the CCTV, the, um, the iPal reader scanner, and those will allow you to see or will read to you. Then the other type of equipment that I thought the library should have was um, equipment for accessing electronic information. And so to do that, um, we bought um, an iZoom flash drive, and that works like Zoom Text. And some of you may be familiar with Zoom Text. And basically, these are programs that um, magnifies everything on your computer screen. So you can go online. Basically, you can use the computer, and it will magnify and enhance the content on your computer, and, um, and iZoom also has the ability to read back to you, although I have to warn you that a lot of programs where they read it back to you, you know, you have to be very careful because sometimes the, the quality can be kind of iffy. Um, so JAWS is a software um, that ha it has screen reading function. Um, it's, um, it's very expensive, just like you know, all these other equipment are. And so we decided not to buy JAWS, but uh, we have downloaded onto a computer uh, that we set aside for our vision center um, a, a, an open source program. It's called NVDA, which stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. And it's, uh, it's basically an open source program for uh, Microsoft Windows. And what it is is that um, it reads everything on the screen uh, back to you. And then the, la the last two things that I bought, um, again, for accessing electronic information um, were an iPad um, and also a keyboard. And the keyboard that I bought uh, was a large size keyboard, um, which is also Bluetooth. So it's very easy to use. And the iPad, as some of you may know, um, is you know, considered the gold standard for accessibility because it has um, the voiceover feature and also Zoom, and uh, and then you can put apps on it. So those were the uh, things that on uh, on my wish list that was presented to the Lions, and so those were the actual uh, devices that we bought. Um, 
But at the library, we also have um, a radio that I got from the Chicago Lighthouse. Uh, it's call, we call it the Chris Radio. And what it is is that uh, the Ch Chicago Lighthouse gets volunteers to read um, the contents of the daily newspapers and people who have the radio. And this radio is free to people who qualify for it if they contact the Lighthouse and um, they qualify for it, they can actually get this radio sent to them free. So we have a radio here that people can check out, try it out, see how well they like it. And basically they can tune in um, and listen to the news of the day. And not just the news, but also the ads read to them uh, from the Tribune, the Sun-Times, the Daily Herald, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and I think some other periodicals as well. And then from another company called LSNS, we have an oversized tactile timer that people can check out as well to, you know, basically to try and see how how well they like something like that before they actually buy it. And then the other thing that I do at the library, you know, besides having the large print books, the audio books, playaways, and things like that. Um, is in, we have information about the Illinois Talking Book, Book Program, which is supported by the uh, Secretary of State's office, which I had mentioned earlier. One thing I'll mention to people soon, Har, is again, we will be sending a follow-up message today that has links to these things. So if you want to go check out any of these things in more detail, mm -hmm. you can do that by following those links in that email. So again, we're tracking all of these, and we'll have links to them links Great. to them so you can you can research that. Thanks, Great. Sunhar. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. Thank you for that reminder. Um, and then I was, yeah, then I just have a, let me see if I can move this slide. Yeah. And this is a, a picture of, I wanted to show people how we are circulating the equipment. So uh, on the right-hand side, um, sorry, it's just kind of a small picture but you can see the iPad, and the iPad has been encased in this special holder. Um, <clears throat> as uh, many of us know, these Apple products can be so delicate. And so I found out about this um, holder that uh, is quite protective. And whether kids are using it or the elderly or, you know, really anybody, um, it's it just you know, gives you that, that extra sense of security. Um, and so we put them in these um, bags that, you know, many libraries have these bags, but basically I, I keep them in the bags and then I have uh, some basic instructions and information on the bag themselves, and then they can uh, circulate that way. The box that you see on the top of the table is the, uh, for the Loki. And then the last picture is a picture of our CCTV. Um, as you can see, there's a tray beneath the monitor, and so you place your reading material on the monitor. Uh, sorry, on the tray, and you can slide that, and you can control the how fast or quickly you can slide that. And then there are the dials uh, to magnify your image, change the color, change the contrast, uh, brightness. Uh, and then there's a feature that allows you to uh, put a line under your text. It's um, it's really uh, you know a brilliant machine. Um, very easy to use is what I really like about it. So those are some of the things that we have, and I wanted to show how we circulate them. And um, so I think that a lot of the participants have questions about technology and um, you know, want to know more about what other equipment are out there, what kind of technology people might have heard about Kurzweil, and uh, you know, like a JAWS, like I mentioned. Um, and when you do your research, really your head can just spin. Um, and I remember many, many times when I was talking to Luke at the Lighthouse, just stopping him and just saying, I'm so sorry, what is that word? You know, how do you spell it? Uh, what does it mean? What does it do? And I just really just, you know, just told myself, I don't know anything about this, and I need to learn. And I just, you know, made the people I was talking to explain until I got it. And it was really worth 
making that effort to, to educate, and I encourage everyone to do that as well. And I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Sunhar. One comment I wanted to make about the finding out the need in your community mm. is if you know your catchment area, if you can find out, for instance, how many persons over age 65 mm. live in that area, we mm. pretty much know standardly that about one in six over 65 is experiencing vision loss due to this common disease uh, epidemic, actually, of macular degeneration or central vision loss. It actually goes up one in five over age 75 and one in four over age 85. Very, Actually, very similar curve to older persons with hearing loss. It's about mm -hmm. exactly the same. So um, when we think about serving all the people in the country with who are blind or low vision, we actually divide that pie into about one quarter are totally blind mm -hmm. and about three quarters are low, what we could consider low vision, meaning low vision meaning that um, they can, a person cannot do this uh, routine daily activities like reading their mail or um, seeing the thermostat on the wall or being, being able to drive <clears throat> may, may or may not be considered legally blind but um, having difficulty f with everyday functioning. So of the low vision persons, uh, about 80% of that group are these older people with macular disease. And so um, it's really slanted towards uh, more older people, although we do, of course, serve children uh, who were born with vision impairments all the way up to the uh, older folks. Um, then I wanted to mention some of the categories Sunhar was saying that can be a little bit overwhelming when we start talking about specific types of technology. So we've put them into categories. And um, actually, if you look on our website, chicagolighthouse.org, and you click on Shop Online, it actually goes to uh, our technology website which we do uh, sales and support and training. But they're actually, the, the categories are actually listed right there for you. Um, and I'll just go over those uh, briefly. So um, for those with low vision, as soon as I mentioned, the video magnifiers, or CCTV is what they used to call them, can magnify from two times to 60 times the normal size. The reason these are so popular is no matter what degree of vision loss somebody has, uh, it really does work for just about everybody. And so uh, I know many libraries have had uh, maybe a big clunker down in the basement or an older model. Of course, now they come with a flat screen surface, and uh, they do look pretty sleek, and some sometimes can actually be moved uh, from place to place. But basically, a person places their reading material or even writing material. You can slide your pen under there, and, and you can do uh, anything that you can do on that tray, uh, looking at uh, books or magazines, looking at objects like a bottle of pills or a can of soup. A person can be pretty independent in function. They all have what's called automatic focus now. Um, then uh, Sunhar mentioned the looky is one in a category we call portable handheld CCTVs or portable video magnifiers. And so with this new flat screen technology being small, uh, 4 inches, 5 inches, 6 inches, or 7 inches, similar to a tablet, although um, these devices are made to do the same thing, where they can be held over a book or uh, they can be held upright. Let's say if a person wants to be able to see something on the wall, a bulletin board or a thermostat on the wall, this has a camera that can magnify from two times up to about 12 or 14, or some of them even go to 20 times the normal size. Of course, the bigger you make it, it doesn't all fit on the screen. So then you do have to move it back and forth. Many of these devices have a handle. Um, and then you can also change the contrast. You can make letters white on black, for instance, for people with that kinds of uh, uh, things. But they're very handy. Uh, they're very small and portable and lightweight. 
what's new in um, the last several years are devices that read out loud. So we have two categories of those. Uh, Sunhar mentioned the iPal Solo, which is a product you just simply place your paper. It automatically senses there's text there, takes a picture, and starts reading. If you want to pause or play, you just simply move your hand uh, under the camera, and so you, there's no need to find any buttons. Uh, the older people really like it. Uh, so this uh, OCR technology, or we call devices that stand alone, can be moved from place to place. And there's about five or six brands now on the marketplace that have these uh, devices that read out loud. Um, I think one of the advantages of coming to the Chicago Lighthouse is that we carry uh, the variety and we carry every brand. So <clears throat> most of these devices are sold by distributors who only sell their particular brand, which can be helpful to learn from, but it doesn't give you the overall feel that sometimes you need for a library to say what one or two products on the market is really going to help the most people and which brand offers that. So having that expertise from myself and my staff here, we can really help uh, guide someone. Um, in, the, in the old days, I call it, uh, we used to have to have one piece of equipment for some people with low vision and another one for totally blind. But because of this new OCR technology, uh, there's devices that uh, will do uh, work for both. So, for instance, there's an OCR called a clear reader uh, where a person can place their uh, document. It will begin reading out loud, and it, ex it accepts a, a computer monitor that can be plugged into the back so a person can actually see the words uh, word by word as they hear the words, and those words can be changed and made very large on the screen. And it highlights each word as it goes across, so it even works for learning disabled uh, persons. So that technology uh, is getting more and more uh, uh, popular. It's also a little bit cheaper than it used to be a couple, just one or two years ago. Tom, we had a question about the iPad. Does it read only handwriting? I mean, does it read only print text, or does it yes. also read handwriting? No, nothing in the world yet that reads handwriting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's a good, <laughs> a good question. But yeah, the Clear Reader is is a, a good product. Um, there's now CCTVs that uh, use a high definition camera, which is really good for persons with um, minimal vision loss because you can get more words on the screen. Uh, the colors are, are nice and brilliant if you're looking at an art book or something like that. But they also now have OCR built into some of the CCTVs. So, for instance, a person can place their uh, paper down. There's a product from a company called Humanware. If you go to humanware.com, and it's called the Prodigy. And so the Prodigy um, is uh, you place your paper down, and it once you've chosen the size of the letters, it shows up on the screen on its own as a column or a line, and uh, you choose speech, and it will also read out loud. Um, so this technology is, is brand new. Something like the Prodigy is brand new uh, that offers that capability, as well as the uh, guts of the machine are actually behind the little screen there, and they make a touchscreen tablet. So the person who's maybe scanned a chapter out of a book can then take that tablet where it is saved on the big machine and grab it and go sit in a comfortable chair and with a set of earphones can listen to the, the chapter and see the words on the screen in whatever size they need all by a little five inch touchscreen tablet. So technology is getting uh, fancier but it's uh, and it's a coming down in price. Uh, that particular one is under 3000 where Many of them are getting closer to 4,000. So uh, there's quite a few options. There are uh, options for scanning and reading uh, devices that read out loud that hook to the computer. That would be a different category. So instead of buying a full standalone device, there are many scanners that now just hook to the computer with a piece of software. I use one called the Plus Tech Book Reader. It's about $700. 
it scans, it opens the window for me, it um, it knows what size and what color I like the letters, and then it shows it on the screen and reads out loud to me. Um, so it's very, very helpful. I push one button to have it read. I push the other button if I want a PDF made for me. Um, so that kind of technology is also available. Um, computers, there's uh, another computer system that Sunhar did not mention called C-Desk. It's the word, the letter C and then the word desk. It's by a company called AdaptiveVoice.com. And it's more for seniors, and it's more for people with low vision. But what's really neat about it is it um, also works for the totally blind because it has giant uh, words. It, it's an application that runs over the top of Windows, so a person doesn't even need to know how to operate Windows to use it. So it's quick and it's easy. Uh, it has some nice features of, of Word. It has a, a news reader feature without having to go to the Internet. A person can just go up and down with their arrows and choose, you know, CNN or Fox or Reuters and then be able to see the daily articles. They hit the enter key and uh, they come up. They've also developed, CDesk has also developed a, uh, uh, a uh, interface for the National Library Service. Um, Sunhar was mentioning the uh, the Secretary of State, but each state is connected to this NLS, uh, National Library Service Talking Books for the Blind, that many of you are familiar with. Uh, they do have a website now for uh, uh, BARD, BARD, NLS BARD, mm -hmm. which is a, uh, a way to download books for the blind. So if a person has a, a, a talking book identification number, they can now go to a, a NLS BARD and try to download a book. We found it very difficult to do, especially for people with low vision oh. or seniors. And we, we counted 23 steps to download a book. So CDesk, what they did is they came up with a way to do it in three easy steps. For libraries around the country, they offer a little uh, jump drive. It's I think it's $20 that the library can purchase and then you can either sell that to um, you know to the people who need it but basically it would have their BARD number in there they could go to any computer in the library slide in their jump drive and it would take them right to the BARD website and in three easy steps they can search for the author or the title they want and then hit download it downloads directly into that little jump drive and then they can, when they remove the jump drive, it, it doesn't leave a mark, and so they um, they can then take that uh, anywhere that they need to go. So uh, especially for blind or visually impaired or seniors who don't have a computer at home, it could be a great service for the library. So again, that's AdaptiveVoice.com is is the company that does that. I see we're getting a lot of um, questions coming in, and we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, and some of the questions are about specific technologies and things. I wonder if we should talk about the training and teaching and outreach and then come back and mm -hmm. go through some of those questions about specific things about technology. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah, so um, I imagine that um, as Tom was talking about all the options out there, you know, I, I can just hear people wondering, uh, and how, how am I going to learn about all that? And I felt the same way, and I still do, you know, just like, just like any technology, it's, uh, it's like learning a new language when it's new to you. It's like learning a new language, and then the other part, of, of course, is that you have to keep using it, but because um, our targeted audience, uh, you know, it's not you know, this is not a group that we, we interact with every day, and so we are not using this equipment every day. So it is a big challenge to keep on top of this technology. Sometimes I feel like I don't use my iPal, uh, you know, for a month, and then if I have to show it to somebody, I have to, you know, give myself a quick refresher. So um, a lot of the manufacturers have online tutorials. Uh, your vendors should provide training, whoever you buy from. The Chicago Lighthouse is very good about that. Um, 
I worked with someone named Linda Hallman who used to work for the Chicago Lighthouse, and she would just come over and just kind of, you know, I call it, you know, playing with the equipment, and that's really what you have to do. You just basically have to use it and play with it to learn it. And, it, it you know, it can be, it can be challenging, um, you know, and I don't consider myself, you know, a high-tech person at all. So that definitely is is a challenge for me. And then, you know, the whole idea of practicing uh, is just so important, which, of course, is easier said than done. Um, and uh, then the other part of it is, you know, training your colleagues, how then, so that's, you know, that's, um, that would be your impetus for learning because then you have to train your colleagues, you know, what if you're not there and someone comes in and wants to use, with, you know, one of the equipment and so you have to train at least one colleague uh, to know how to use it as well. And then the other part, part of it is just talking it up among your colleagues, especially say with the circulation staff, um, we keep our equipment, and I see someone ask about the bags, and I will get my tech department uh, took care of that for me, so I will get the information for Brenda to tell you where you can buy those bags, which I like very much also. Um, you know, just talking it up all the time and encouraging them to, uh, you know, to share the information with, uh, with patrons. Um, I just can't say enough about that. Um, then, of course, after all that, you know, learning about the technology, learning how to use it, then really your biggest job is still ahead of you, which is the outreach and the marketing. And um, and I feel like, you know, from the time we um, launch our, um, you know, our services, um, it's I feel like it's just been nonstop marketing. Um, I the way I launched it was I held two uh, what I call vision fairs at the library. And what I did was I contacted vendors and other people who work in the kind of the, you know, the vision area. For example, the um, Department of Health Services has uh, a, a bureau uh, for the blind. And so I contacted, you know, someone there uh, and had people from the Lighthouse come out someone from Spectrios, and basically called it, you know, an information fair. And, um, you know, that was one way to kind of, you know, to tell your community what you have and what you're, you know, you can try to do for them. Um, I sent out, I made, uh, we had signs made up, and I sent out more than 50. I sent them to schools, to other libraries, to uh, doctor's offices, hospitals, uh, school for the blind, you know, just any group that you can think of that would, you know, remotely, you know, be in contact with somebody. Uh, and that's, you know, really any kind of school and health care provider, senior homes, Itasca, um, as I mentioned earlier, is very small. Unfortunately, we don't so have so we don't have many of these. So I send them to neighboring communities. You know, just reach out, just cast your net as far as you can. So I did a couple of those fairs, and then of course, um, you know, your newsletters, your websites, your Facebook. You need to just keep putting it out there. Uh, you need to have signs in house. Uh, find out your local health fairs, most hospitals would have information about that. Um, in June, our community college um, was the site for um, an event called the Visually Impaired Awareness Day. And uh, so we had a, a, a table there uh, with some of our equipment. Um, I made um, brochures. Um, and, uh, and then at the just before the start of the school year, I sent letters to principals in our school district inviting the uh, school librarians, their special ed teachers, uh, you know, whether to come out and visit the library to learn more about our equipment uh, and maybe how, you know, their students can benefit from them. And I also offered to go and talk to them. I did have two teachers, two special ed teachers come out to, um, to visit, and I, you know, gave them a tour and talked to them about equipment. Um, and, uh, you know, visit senior homes, um, partner with other libraries because we are small. 
uh, one of the libraries that's pretty close by that also has a lot of assistive technology is the Bloomingdale Public Library. So um, I have visited the outreach librarian there, and she has visited me, and uh, we plan to work together. We plan to do a fair together, maybe with another smaller library. And so, you know, you just have to um, work with, I think the key is to just try and work with as many people as you can. That was something we had a few questions about that, just people wondering how do you market to older adults who have vision challenges and people are finding that there's some um, shyness about using technology in the library. So these are some good ideas for, yeah. for outreach. Yeah, definitely that's very true. And I, you know, I had to do with that, and I don't really have an answer for you. We have a patron who comes in to use the computer, and he brings his magnifying glass, and he holds it up to the computer screen. And, uh, you know, we were like, oh, we have the eye zoom. That's perfect. This is, this is how you use it, and you don't have to hold your magnifying glass to the computer screen anymore. And we showed, it, we showed him a couple of times, but then after that we noticed that he does not ask for it. You know, whether he's shy or he just doesn't want to have to deal with learning, you know, how do I use this, what – you know, something new you have to learn with. So that is definitely a lot of resistance. I mean, I do have people ask about it, but then I don't really see them come in to you, so I can relate to that. That will just be a constant challenge, and we just cannot uh, give up. We just have to keep trying, keep reaching out. Go to your senior centers. Um, contact them. Ask them if you can do a little presentation. I did that for a little group. And, uh, you know, you, you don't know who it's going to reach, how, um, but you just have to keep putting the word out there and spreading it out as much as you can. Work with your township. They usually have senior services. I've done that. Um, you know, find out about health fairs, set up your table, um, and just keep at it. I mentioned the Lions Clubs, and uh, often I think just doing a short presentation at one of their meetings, they're always looking for speakers. And I told them and kind of challenged them. I said, if um, instead of spending $3,000 on one person, why don't you consider giving the money to a library so that everybody in the community uh, could use the technology? Because there are so many now, over 65, who who need uh, something like that. So. Um, the other resource is the American Foundation for the Blind, afb.org. Uh, they have lots and lots of resources there. Uh, they also even have a directory of services for every state, so you can call them and find out all the organizations in your state. They have a wonderful newsletter called Access World, which will help you. It's also an app you can just download on your phone. It will help you keep up with every month what's new in technology. Great. Um, we have a, an organization in um, uh, DuPage County called Donka Inc. Uh, that I, uh, it's D O N K A Inc. Um, they also work, um, you know, trying to teach um, people with disabilities how to use computer, uh, and they give free classes to people eligible. So there are many groups out there, and uh, partner with them. Uh, Donka is going to come to the library to do a presentation. So just you know, everything that you can do, I would say, just keep doing it. I offer lots and lots of help, too, because I know people around the, the country. So if you want to email me directly, it's tom.persky, P-E-R-S-K-I, at chicagolighthouse.org, and I can connect you with people in your area or if you have specific questions. Good. Well, we have just one minute left. Any final words, Sunhar or Tom, that you want to share before we start wrapping up for today? Um, can I just say two things? Uh, sure. One, the, uh, the talking book program in uh, Illinois has now been consolidated, so they no longer have those different centers. Everything is at Illinois Talking Book Outreach Center. So if you do IllinoisTalkingBooks.org, then that will give you all the information you need. And other states should have similar talking book pro programs as well. And I just want to say that I think it's great that so many libraries are interested in uh, getting uh, the services started or wanting to provide more. There is so much that we can do 
um, and don't be discouraged. Don't give up. Um, just keep doing it because even if you just reach that, you know, uh, one person a month or, you know, you would have at least helped that one person. So thank you, Brenda and Tom. Yeah, definitely the need is out there, as I mentioned, is one in six over 65. So, And it's growing in the next 30 years that it will be doubling as the baby boomers get older. So the need is pressing. It's really at epidemic proportions. So you'll be helping lots and lots of people. Good. Well, thank you both for sharing your resources and your expertise with us today. And I think you'll all be glad to remember that we're sending out that message later today. We've been scribbling, um, copying and pasting, and making sure that everything that has been mentioned is in this follow-up message that you'll get today. So you'll have a chance to explore all of these resources in more depth at that time. So again, thank you both so much for your time and sharing your expertise. We hope people will join us again on December 3rd for our next EDGE Initiative webinar. And we want to thank ReadyTalk, our sponsor for today's session. So thank you, everyone. There's an evaluation form you'll get at the end of the session. If you can share your thoughts on this session and on future sessions, that would help us a lot. Again, thank you so much to Tom and Sunhar. Thank you, Brenda, and thank you to everyone for listening. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. Bye now. Bye-bye.